Good morning, everybody. Welcome to some Civil War poetry. I'm Vincent Hanna, and this is my office in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So good morning. Happy Wednesday. We're halfway through the week. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just wanted to dive on in and let you know that uh, we will not be featuring some uh, this day in Civil War history or, quote, again today. Uh, something I came across something yesterday that struck me as uh, not this day in Civil War history, but this day in Civil War today. <laughs> uh, and what do I mean by that? Um, I'll get to it in just a second. First, I got to have a cup of coffee. I got to I got to get my slurp on here. Let's see if the coffee's hot. Burns the lips not the tongue or throat. So it's been a morning already, so I'm just going to try to get this uh, sucker down. Woo-wee. <sighs> All right. This day in Civil War today. Uh, I came across um, a an issue in North Florida um, where... There's a, a county courthouse, and it has a giant mural on the ground floor depicting like hundreds of years of this county's history. You're with me so far. I'm, I'm like, this is cool. In the upper right-hand corner, very subtly painted are three riders on horseback, each wearing white pointy cloaks. Okay, <laughs> er, stop right there. You've painted three Klansmen in your mural of your county's history. Is this some, okay, well, maybe this is, maybe they're not, they're not, they're not celebrating it. Yeah, it's in a courthouse, but they're not celebrating it. It's just part of the history. Okay, let me read you some history. And this is not my history. This is, I believe, the painter and he has, uh, this is part of the historical description on pamphlets, on, ed on educational uh, reading material that visitors to the courthouse can read to learn more about the mural. And this is from the Herald Tribune. Um, so, yeah, one second here. Okay. Barber wrote an accompanying historical guide to the mural, and he gave a guest book so people could offer their opinions. Quote, When the group known as the Radical Republicans gained control of the state in 1868, the Reconstruction program took an unpleasant turn. The reversed order was severely resented by a large segment of the white population. Lawlessness among ex-slaves and troublesome whites was the rule of the day. No relief was given by the carpetbag and scallywag government or by the Union troops. The result was the emergence of secret societies claiming to bring law and order to the, to the county. One of these groups was the Ku Klux Klan, an organization that sometimes, sometimes took vigilante justice to extremes, but was sometimes the only control the county knew over those outside the law. The Klan faded from view at the end of Reconstruction. It had minor comebacks in the 1920s and mid-1950s. Since then, it has become the subject of legend rather than a cause of fear. There is so much wrong with that whitewashed general lovey-dovey view of the Ku Klux Klan that... I could go on for another 20 minutes, but I just want you to do your own research on the KKK. Know that they were such a heinous terrorist group terrorizing free blacks of the South in the 1870s during Reconstruction. The Ulysses S. Grant pushed through an official act to combat them. The Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, I think. They... <laughs> had minor resurgences in the 50s and 20s where they lynched untold amounts of African Americans and murdered the 18 I'm just thinking of the 1961 um 
bombing where three innocent children were murdered by the supposedly legendary Ku Klux Klan. So the fact that this um, is on a mural in a courthouse where people are supposed to feel equal in the eyes of the law, that is systemic racism. Whether or not there are laws protecting, written laws protecting your rights, the fact that somebody has written this and painted this, that's, the, that's an example of the systemic racism that people are talking about when they say change needs to happen. Okay. Thank you for going with me on that one. Uh, but that, that really, that really pissed me off. So uh, I hope it pisses you off and you can read, um, just Google Florida KKK mural and, you know, read it for yourself, do your own research on the reconstruction era and the, uh, twenties and fifties civil rights movements. Okay. Today's featured poems, um, are by individuals named John Greenleaf Whittier and John Reuben Thompson. For those of you who are new, <laughs> I don't typically begin my mornings with a rant such as that, but when it comes to systemic racism, especially, we all need to be on guard. So regardless, the book is Poetry of the Civil War. It is divided into two groups, one the blue, one the gray. Each morning, I'll read one poem from each side. That's the Union and Confederate forces. And just do some comparing and contrasting, get a feel for how um, contemporary folks were feeling about this uh, extremely traumatic experience in their lives when their country was being torn asunder. So our first poem is called The Battle Autumn of 1862. It is by John Greenleaf Whittier. From who lived from 1807 to 1892. He was born in Haverville, Massachusetts. He received little in the way of formal education, yet made his literary debut at the age of 19. Whittier's first book, Legends of New England, was published in 1831. A dedicated abolitionist, he entered politics and promoted the cause through his editorship of a number of influential periodicals. Whittier turned from politics after the Civil War and dedicated himself completely to poetry. His fame increased greatly with the publication of Snowbound in 1866, a long narrative poem. In his time, Whittier was considered one of the great American poets, second only to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. After his death, several states declared holidays on his birthday. And I mentioned Whittier in episode one of this podcast. I never heard of him. And if he, and I, I'm going to believe that he was as great as Longfellow in his day, A, why did he kind of um, slip into the, the memories of history? And what states uh, celebrate his birthday as a holiday? Any English uh, nerds out there or American lit <clears throat> fanatics, do reach out. Let me know. I think we'd all appreciate it. Our second poem for the day is called Ashby. It is by a fellow named John Reuben Thompson. And Mr. Thompson lived from 1823 to 1873, was born in Richmond, Virginia. He studied law at the University of Virginia. In 1847, he became the editor of the Southern Literary Messenger. Thompson went on to edit several other Southern periodicals before emigrating to England during the war. After the conflict, he returned to the United States, settling in New York, where he became literary editor of the New York Evening Post. All right. Well, based on that short description, um, he seems all right. Clearly a Southern sympathizer, though, which does mean traitor. So I'd like to do a little bit more research on him, see what his deal was. Again, if you know, share. All righty. Here is why you are all here. The Battle Autumn of 1862 by John Greenleaf Whittier. The flags of war like storm birds fly, the charging trumpets blow, yet rolls no thunder in the sky, no earthquake strives below. In calm and patient, nature keeps her ancient promise well, though o'er her bloom and greenness sweeps the battle's breath of hell. And still she walks in golden hours through harvest-happy farms, 
and still she wears her fruits and flowers like jewels on her arms. What mean the gladness of the plain, this joy of eve and morn, the mirth that shakes the beard of grain and yellow locks of corn? Oh, eyes may be full of tears, and hearts with hate are hot, but even paste come round the years, and nature changes not. She meets with smiles our bitter grief, with songs our groans of pain. She mocks with tint of flower and leaf the war field's crimson stain. Still, in the cannon's pause, we hear her sweet thanksgiving psalm. Too near to God for doubt or fear, she shares the eternal calm. She knows the seed lies safe below, the fires that blast and burn. For all the tears of blood we sow, she waits the rich return. She sees with clearer eye than ours the good of suffering born, the hearts that blossom like her flowers and ripen like her corn. Oh, give to us in times like these the vision of her eyes and make her fields and fruited trees our golden prophecies. Oh, give to us her finer ear above this stormy din. We too would hear the bells of cheer ring peace and freedom in. Oh, John Greenleaf, Whittier, everybody. I think his first poem had um, a similar feel, but just this, this overwhelming sense of, of hope that hell reigns on the, the fields right now. But underneath, there are seeds waiting to blossom uh, the good of suffering born. This child is suffering right now, but you know what? In 20 years, they're going to change the, they're, they're going to change the world. It's going to be, they're going to make a better world of it. That's nice. I think that's something we can take away from today. Okay. Our gray poem of the day is called Ashby. Again, it is by John Reuben Thompson. To the brave all homage render. Weep ye skies of June. With a radiance pure and tender, shine, O saddened moon. Dead upon the field of glory, hero fit for song and story, lies our bold dragoon. Well they learned whose hands have slain him, braver knightlier foe, Never fought with moor nor painmen, rode at Temple Stow. With a mien how high and joyous, gainst the hordes that would destroy us, went he forth we know. Never more, alas, shall saber gleam around his crest, fought his fight, fulfilled his labor, stilled his manly breast, all unheard, sweet nature's cadence. Trump of fame and voice of maidens, now he rests, he takes his rest. Earth that all too soon hath bound him, gently wrap his clay, linger lovingly around him, light of dying day. Softly fall the summer showers, birds and bees among the flowers make the gloom seem, seem gay. There, throughout the coming ages, when his, word, when his sword is rust and his deeds in classic pages mindful of her trust, Shall Virginia, bending lowly, still a ceaseless vigil holy, keep above his dust? All right. I feel like John Reuben Thompson was trying to emit some of the same hope, despite hope, that Whittier was. However, in my first read-through, he did seem less eloquent. He tried to use some big words with uh, tricky cadence that clearly I was tripping over. So I don't know. Um, I think John, Leaf, John Greenleaf Whittier warrants more exploration. I hope there's more of him in this book um, until we find him. I just want to give you a little preview for tomorrow. We will be reading The Wounded Dresser by perhaps the greatest American poet, Walt Whitman. He's uh, the first poem we've read of his. So that's The Wound Dresser by Walt Whitman. And then our Southern poem for tomorrow is called Stonewall Jackson's Way. And that is by John Williamson Palmer. So, so probably some good things to look forward to tomorrow. Um, again, this is some Civil War poetry. Again, uh, fight systemic racism whenever you can. Read whenever you can. 
and uh, foster your own your own views on everything. Uh, thank you very much. We'll see you tomorrow, 7.30 Central Time. So long.